Hello and welcome to Reef Talk. I'm Scott Anderson with Mile High Reefers. I'm here with Steve Rotter of Rotter 2 Reef. And our special guest today is Darren DeGraw from Northwest Marine 62. Hi, guys. So today's topic is on keeping tangs. Um, I, we kind of picked this because as far as the three of us go, that's definitely our favorite fish to keep. Mm-hmm. And um, I know I've been on a tang kick lately. Steve's got more tangs than can even fit in a 125. <laughs> <laughs> and the blue tang will go in there once it matures as well. So we're going to be hitting eight tangs in a 125-gallon tank. Break the Great. rules. Whatever. And then every time I get excited because I buy a fish, I get a laundry list from Darren of all the stuff he just bought. It's usually <laughs> eight or ten fish coming down. So tanks sound like a fun one to talk about today. <laughs> so <clears throat> to start with, um, I know we talked about this the other day with the dory fish, but tangs are kind of your intermediate fish to keep. It's not your easiest fish to keep, so probably not the first fish you should buy for your tank if you're new to reef keeping. So we'll just put that right off the bat, that they're a little more difficult, and a lot of that comes down to the risk of ick and marine velvet. And I know you guys are kind of ick and marine to velvet off today out on that one, so just know that it's a big risk, they need quarantine, and we'll skip that subject for the rest of this video but just know they are parasite magnets. So um, I think maybe the best part is just to kind of talk about what kind of tangs are out there, how you keep multiples together and stuff like that. And I think let's um, start with Steve. Tell us how you have so many tangs in such a small tank because what you're doing is really impressive. <laughs> I thought you were going to say what you're doing is really wrong. <laughs> no, 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 no. But because look, it kind of is. It, but when you look at your videos of your tank, right. they really are doing well. And what's a relatively small tank. Right. It's a one. And, it's 125 uh, gallon, six feet long. Yeah. Right. Compared to yours, you've got the 210. Or Darren's monster. Yeah. What, 300? Soon to be. Yeah, I've got a 180 and a 300. Yes. So... Um, well, you know what? Uh, so what was the question? Which... So how are you keeping so many tangs in a small tank? Well, relatively small. I mean, you have the right size tank for right. tangs. you got a six-foot tank, but you've got, what, seven tangs in there right now? Yeah, and two of them are large, very large. Um, how am I doing it? You know what? I, I don't know. It just happens. Uh, one of the key things is just you know making sure those guys are happy. I do a weekly water change of 10 gallons, and I just pushed it up, and that was fine, and I just pushed it up to 15 gallons last week, so I do a weekly water change of 15 gallons, and um, where I do the water change from is important, because I want to get rid of as many nitrates as I can, so to stress the fish out a little less, and to get more nitrates out during that water change, I'll siphon out all the water from my sump, and you're vacuuming up all the crap and uneaten food and stuff from there. So that's good. That removes that. And then it all, and then I'm replacing uh, with fresh salt water directly into the sump. So they don't get as stressed out because, you know, the water's not coming in where they're at. Um, also, to get rid of nitrates, what I started doing is um, siphoning out the water with a little tiny pump um, with a hose to a bucket. Um, the overflows because a lot of food and garbage settles to the bottom of the overflows, and I have two, one on each side of the tank. I'll vacuum that out. It does wonders. And then I'll just, of course, you know, fill it back in the sump, turn the pumps on, and as they're pumping through, the water's going through. Um, I think I may want to start vacuuming the sand less. I'm going to try this as an experiment, but I vacuum my sand with a siphon. Um, I got a sand sifting star, so he should help stir up the sand and loosen all the uneaten food and stuff so they can go through the filtration system. As far as their personalities, I kind of got lucky because they all get along really well, and when you add fish to a tank, 
tangs especially, you really should add the yellow tang last. Um, my yellow tang was in before I added the Nassau tang and the sailfin tang. And um, when I put the sailfin tang in out of quarantine, the yellow tang did not like it one bit at all. So I was kind of thinking I may need to rehome the sailfin. But after about two days, completely peaceful. And like you said, Scott, oh my guys, they, they get along and there's a lot in there. It's really neat because they actually all school together. They've got these seven or eight tangs schooling together. Now, I do feel bad for them nice. once in a while. It is a 125-gallon tank. They're not crammed. Amazingly right. enough, there's enough room for all of them with some to spare. Um, and it's six feet long, so there's plenty enough swimming room. I would love to have. Um, and Ed from Ed's Tank Extreme was asking last night during the live show, when am I going to get a larger tank? I don't know. I'm kind of thinking I might not. But if I do, it'll be a year or two. A 240, so I get the eight foot long. That'd be amazing. Yeah, to put those guys in. But then, unfortunately, I'll have to keep them in the basement. But you know what? I got lucky. Um, their personalities are all great because, as we've said, um, you want to keep certain fish with certain fish and don't combine them. But in the end, you might get lucky because it might come down to the fish. Now, I did have to. I did have a starry blenny in the tank. And he didn't want anything. He he was killing off my uh, my gobies, so I had to rehome him to the 45 gallon. So that's where he lives. He's no longer in the 125. My sand sifter goby was in hiding for four months. <laughs> he would never come out. I might see his head poke out from on a rock, maybe once every three weeks. A lot of times I thought he was a goner. As soon as I took that starry blenny out, he was doing his job sifting stand that night. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to say is, um, you know, feed them well. Feed them uh, nori. They're vegetarians. So I'll put a huge stalk or two of bok choy, uh, rubber banded to a PVC small one-inch pipe, only this long, and in the tank daily, and they wait for it, and they all go to town on it. Um, so if you keep them fed, you'll keep them happy. And uh, they are... Tangs are notorious for being dirty, so you do want to vacuum the sand. You want to have a good filtration system. Any mechanical filtration that you use, you want to make sure you clean it like every three days. You have to, or else those nitrates are going to multiply. That's all I can think of right now. I had a couple other things, but I'll let you guys take over. Um, I got lucky. My guys all get along really well. I introduced them slowly over time, and I monitored the first day or two for any aggression. Um, luckily, they're all very nice to each other. So you're really focusing on the length of the tank when you bought it to make sure it was long enough. You were very tang specific when you purchased your tank because you know that you're getting water quality is something you mentioned there I think is huge. And then yeah. feeding it. Feeding is incredibly important with these guys to manage the aggression. Definitely. Yeah. Um, Darren, I know you keep buying tangs. How do you decide which tangs you're buying? Um. Actually, uh, I really don't. Um, whatever, really, <laughs> whatever really grabs me. Um, you know, I uh, when I first started, I, I did have a Fowlery Tang, and uh, he didn't make it in quarantine. But um, you know, I've kind of evolved a little bit. Um, well, a lot of the research I've done made a lot of mistakes. Uh, as a typical newbie, I've been in saltwater now for a year. Next month, so I, I would consider myself a newbie still. Um, but you know, I was uh, into freshwater fish for 20 years, so your husbandry skills, right? You know, come into play. It's just a different type of uh, uh, fish you're dealing with in the ecosystem. But um, that's one fish I would like to get. It's a beautiful tang. Um, but um, when I've added tangs in my tank, um, I've added them at nighttime. I did that with my cichlids. And then um, what I used to do with my cichlids is I would uh, rearrange the, the uh, uh, aquascaping, but you can't really do that on a saltwater tank because right. you're dealing with a bunch of rock. So what I would do is um, I've been introducing my fish at nighttime. Uh, it's, a lot, it's a lot easier on the incoming fish. And then um, I got some tail slapping on a couple of my tanks when I did introduce them, but they get along great, like Steve was saying. Um, I've just got four of them in my 300 right now. And um, I've got uh, a trio of them in my 180. And uh, as you saw in my last video, 
um, and they get along great. So I would like to get some more zebra somas, maybe another purple tang in my 300, as well as uh, maybe a couple of uh, yellow tangs um, and a fallery tangs on my want list too. That will definitely go in my 300. Um, nice. I think like Steve was saying, it's uh, it comes down to nutrition. You saw my video when I was feeding Nori and I can't even get my hand in the tank. Um, <laughs> they, go, they go nuts over that. So uh, I don't know if you guys were feeding this, but uh, um, I was using a product and I can't find it anymore. It's made by a company called New Era. It's a uh, it's an uh, algae grazer ring. It's about this big and it's three yeah. types of uh, seaweed compressed. Right. And uh, I think you used to use that, didn't you, Steve? Yeah, I, I still think do. They yeah, were, think, they, were, they changed they the name. Business. They were bought out by another company. Yeah, yeah, the I name don't... went out of business and then they changed their name. I, I cannot remember what the, they're going under another name now. Um, they were going bankrupt, and someone bought them out, so they changed the name. I I'll have to find out. But yeah, those those are awesome. My fish. Love yeah, that's them. what I was saying. They uh, my fish really like that. Um, and uh, I feed a variety of uh, of foods to my to my fish and my tangs. I I use Rod's food. I feed them the uh, nori. Yep. Um, Rod's my food is a big friend. one. Yep. And what I'm going to start doing is uh, uh, my local reef store is I asked for some PE mysis shrimp. Um, the shrimp, they're uh, basically they're, they're gut loaded with, with brine. Now these mysis shrimp uh, out of, by the company called PE, they're out of Canada and they're freshwater. So a um, little bit better nutrient. Um, but I'm feeding them the uh, mysis shrimp right now. And um, I feed them uh, herbivore food to my tanks as well. So I try to uh, give them uh, a different selection. I feed a spirulina brine, and then I use a Celcon on my food about three times a week, and uh, it really helps to bolster their immune system. I've also noticed that the fish just love the Celcon. They just go yeah. crazy when you add the Celcon to it. Yeah, Cyber Aquarius uh, turned me on to that, and uh, it's been around for a while, but it's got amino acids in it, and uh, what I do is uh, um, I'll take the uh, cube food and I'll turn it upside down and I'll go ahead and drop the cell con in there so it kind of creates a little cavity. Let it sit in there for about 10 minutes and then I'll add some RO water to break it down and then I feed it. That way the uh, cell cons permeated into the food and uh, hmm. my fish really like that. Hmm. I also like to soak my pellets in the uh, um, cell con because it's a uh, dry food. It does a nice job absorbing the cell con hmm. and the fish just seem to love that makes it more palatable yeah yeah, yeah. i've never you used that either. maybe i'll have to check that out i just put some of their tank water in a small little dish put the pellets in it because i feed them the pellets as well as the the bok choy leaves um they go nuts for that i mean the fowlery tang doesn't leave much <laughs> for uh anyone else he he sees the, he sees <laughs> that dish and he goes ballistic Oh yeah, it's like yeah. A, a, a Hoover vacuum. They're yeah. just gone. Um, so I have to try that. Um, How big is your Fowlery tank now, Steve? Um, he's pretty large. He's, you know, I have to try and measure him. I don't know. He's he's, he's you maybe, know what's interesting? maybe ten inches, something like that. Wow. Yeah. You know what's interesting? You'll <laughs> solid. You'll see. So. You'll see it looking at the description of the tang what their what their um, length can be, but of course that's their max length in the wild. And you can cut that in half, and you get in, into a uh, into a domesticated uh, you know environment like a, an aquarium, depending how big it is. And I also think that uh, having a good flow is inherent. Mm -hmm. You know, you want to have good filtration for the tanks too. And I know you do, Steve. You got a, a good filtration set up there. Um, I think that's important too because they are very messy fish. <laughs> yeah, they so, are. So I think you guys are bringing up some pretty good points about size because tangs come in some pretty big ranges in size. A uh, little yellow tang or yellow eye coal tang. I mean, those guys will max out at six or seven inches. Those that's kind of as big as they get. Where a naso or like my Vlamingi, those guys can push two feet. Mm -hmm. They get they get huge. So yeah, I mean no. and that's one and that's one thing you really gotta um, think about. And the big fish grow 
fast. Like my Vlamingi when I got him um, in February, the end of February was maybe two and a half inches. Now he's almost as long as my blue tang, which is a six wow. inch fish. I mean, this guy is growing so fast. It's crazy. Um, I think that's incredibly important for somebody to think about. And then it just seems right. like this, the fish that don't get so big don't grow so fast. So that's something to really think about when you're purchasing your fish. Yeah, a lot of people don't, unfortunately. Um, they just see, you know, all these little guys in the aquarium like, oh, I want to get a blue tang. He's what, two inches maybe <laughs> when you buy him. Um, oh, the fowlery looks great or whatever. Or Tenenti Tang is gorgeous. I want to get one of those eventually. Yeah, they are. In the same family yeah. as that. That's, and I was almost going to get one, but I didn't want to risk the um, Fowlery fighting with them because they, they could, but whatever. My Fowlery is so laid back. So I got a fox face instead, and he's very sweet. Um, and then I pushed the edge. I was done with fish, but I saw this Nassau Tang that I had to have. And then... <laughs> I saw the sailfin <laughs> tang because I had a Dester genie that died and I loved it. And Scott just got one of those. It's gorgeous. I'm like, yeah. damn, I want them both. I can only have one, but I shouldn't even have one more. And I just told the guy, I'll take them both. And I, I put them in, you know. And it, and everyone's great. <laughs> everyone's awesome. But see, that's the thing. It's like you see these guys and they're like small. You forget like the blue tangs. If they live, they're gonna be pretty big. And my fox face. That guy was maybe, you know, almost three inches when I bought him. Maybe, not even, maybe two and a half, three. That guy is huge. He's a little over six inches now. Wow. Yeah, in, I have in a... In six uh, months. Those guys, not even six months. Those guys grow fast. I have a magnificent fox face when I first got in the hobby. He's on my 300. He was about about uh, two and a half, three inches, and he's pushing seven inches now. See, and yeah. uh, beautiful, beautiful fish. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really nice uh especially when they flare up their dorsals oh yeah yeah it's, it's really nice uh but uh um you know i was gonna say that um you know having tags in my in my opinion and i don't think anyone will say the same thing that's watching is that um having a good diet for them is really paramount um having a good uh a good f flow system good filtration i think is <clears throat> really important as well um for their health but um, you know, I'm still learning. But uh, in my opinion, I think diets, having a diverse diet, is really important, and getting getting the uh, proper nutrients to them, especially a lot of different types of uh, vegetables, seaweed, it helps their immune system. So, so I think you make a great point with diet because tangs are at risk for hole in head and lateral line disease, which is thought to be diet related. It's not scientifically proven yet but that's kind of what people are thinking um the other thing is i think um diet is huge for controlling aggression in tangs yeah. um these guys can fight but it seems like if you feed them well they're a lot less likely to get into it yeah i i agree um i agree with that and uh diet is important and i also think bolstering it with what i uh, said before is the cell con um yeah which Cyber Aquarius turned on to me about that. And, uh, you know, I feed it to my fish two or three times a week, and uh, they really like it. So something you might want to try, Steve. Yeah, I think, how do you spell that? Cellcon. C-E-L-L? S-E-L-C-O-N. Okay. Cellcon. And it comes in two different sizes. Okay. It's a pink bottle with a dropper. Maybe uh, I'll... Uh... I'll try that with the heart, the the pellets. You know, it's it's good stuff. I I like it. I use I use it every two or three days or so. How, <clears throat> uh, Darren, you said a dropper. So what? Just in with there's salt water in a dish, two drops, or how how much are you guys dosing? It, and it comes in, a, in it food. comes in a dropper, and I don't know what Scott's doing, but um, I'll take. Uh, of course, I, I if I'm just feeding like a flat pack food. I'll just uh, take a like one full dropper and I'll disperse it on there, let it soak in. And if you're feeding a cube food, um, put it so the cavity is up, you know, facing up. There's a little indentation, and then just go ahead and I put about two droppers in because I'm feeding six or seven cubes of mysis shrimp or brine, and uh, it soaks it in. I let it sit there for about ten minutes, 
and I'll take some uh, some RO water I'll, with a turkey baster and I'll, I'll put it in there, let it absorb, and then wait till it breaks apart and then I'll just feed it. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty similar to what I've been doing with the Celcon. I just put mine right onto the frozen food or I'll um, put some right onto the pellets and let it soak into the pellets. And I don't really measure it out. I just put some on until it looks like it's kind of soaking in pretty good. Okay. Right. That sounds pretty um, good. I just want to make sure that it stays on or in the food, not when you put it in the tank. It just kind of washes away off the food, you know? So. The other thing that I think is probably pretty important to cover with tangs is going to be um, aggression and fish selection. I know this one's bit me pretty hard. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of tangs out there that you should probably avoid unless you really want these two fish. And those are going to be your clown tangs and your show hole tangs. They just are so violent fish right so if you want to keep those guys you're going to need a big tank and you're just going to need to plan on it and you're almost not going to have to go species specific it can be done but it's definitely not something for beginners um and personally it's just something i'm avoiding they're really beautiful fish but it's just they're beasts yeah of um, course uh you know uh, michael from aaron's aquarium oh yes as his in his system um and he said pretty good luck with it but of course if you watch his videos that that tang that soul hall tang right. dominates his whole tank oh, it, it it totally does and he also says his blue tang is the show holes punching bag yeah yeah so i mean even somebody with like michael with a massive tank he has to really think about what he's doing and he does a great job with it but it's it's a tough fish to keep for the average person in my opinion, they're more suited towards like big predatory tanks. Like if you're going to put big groupers or something in a tank like that. Um, other things that you got to keep in mind are the genuses of the fish, right? Once you start mixing similar looking fish or fish of the same genus, then they start to fight. That's what bit me in the past. I had a purple tang and a yellow tang in the same tank. I just had two of them. They did great for a year. Then the yellow tank snapped and started beating on the purple tang, wouldn't let him come out of the rock work to eat. So the yellow tang has been hanging out in my sump for, I don't know, six, eight months now, something like that. I um, don't feel too bad for him. It's like an 80 gallon tank he's in. It's actually the frag tank. Got yeah. a bunch of coral in there, clam. He's fine. But, um, anyways, the strategy I'm currently working on to deal with this aggression is having a lot more tangs in the tank and then a lot more zebra somas so when he was a when this happened it was a blue tang a purple tang and a yellow tang that's all i had in the tank i've added my yellow eye coal tang the flamingi the powder blue i got the sail fin and then at the reef store they've got a purple tang that they're holding for me so it's going to be like eight tangs in the tank <laughs> So that's the plan. We'll see. That's if this awesome. Blows up. But we'll see if this blows up my face, right? Theoretically, it should work. I hear about it working for people. My plan is, if I have aggression, I'm just going to throw more zebra somas at the tank. Well, I'm glad if you're getting it, all mean, these. I'm glad you're getting all these tangs. I am. Um, yeah. Because your your tank, in my opinion, um, was starving for attention. It looks awesome with the rock <laughs> and the coral, but you had like what? Well, one clownfish and. That's it. I I had plenty of fish, but I didn't have <laughs> enough tanks. No, you did not. And you know what? <laughs> I'm requesting a video, unless he's still in quarantine. I'm requesting a powder blue video from you. I want to see that fish. Yeah. Um. So I was gonna make that yesterday. That's a whole nother story All about right. my calcium reactor dying on me. But <laughs> that fish. I spent the whole afternoon doing work on the reef instead of videoing it. Uh, that <laughs> I think uh, that I think is going to be a, uh, a great fish. I, I think uh, as far as what Scott was saying, uh, getting uh, genus specific tangs is important too. There's a, a couple of tangs that I would like. Uh, I would like the soul hall, but I think if I ever did get that tang, it would be the last fish I would put in there, um, and that's after having my tank. Um, running for a while 
another another really beautiful tang is a barini b-a-r-i-e-n-e but it gets huge um yeah it's a really really big tang really colorful but as i told you before steve uh, the uh, fowlery is on my on my want list um but uh I would like to get some more zebra salmis and, and put in there maybe another purple, a couple, mm-hmm. two or three elks in my 300. Um, I, and as far as my uh, 180, my reef goes, I'm going to be uh, getting a variety of fish. You guys will see that in my later videos. So, um, but I've got a trio of tangs in it right now. I'd like to get probably a couple more in there. And uh, the three that I've got in there now are doing great. Uh, I've got a. Uh, a uh, blonde naso tang and i've got a chevron and then i've got a uh, uh, powder brown and they're getting mm. along it's great fantastic nice. i love those powder browns yeah me too now i would just i would just like to say i like my powder blue he's a great fish but those powder browns are so underrated they don't look like much in the pictures but when you see one in person the colors are spectacular and they're like half the price of a powder blue yeah really yeah. really uh really nice color uh, so are the uh, white cheek tangs those are very yeah. underrated fish too very um nice. well they call them a gold rim naso but uh those two fish are very underrated and it's amazing on the price of the powdered brown versus the uh, the uh, powdered blue they're like half the price um i would love amazing. to get a powder blue like this is if i got a larger tank like a 240 right i would love to get a powder blue or because you guys are talking about it, the powder brown because the price and they are underrated gorgeous a powder brown with a tenenti tang and a Desjardini tang would be awesome now powder blues have a reputation for aggression um, do they? Yeah. oh they have a reputation for being pricks um, I haven't seen it in, <laughs> I haven't seen it in my tank hmm. yet but um, my my powder blue is like two and a half inches. He's the little guy in the tank. Mm. And I and I think that might be, and, I, and at least I feel that's important with aggressive fish. Like if I was to get a show hole or something, I would start off with a small one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And let it, and let it grow up in the tank rather than taking a big fish and sticking it in. Right. I think, I think you might avoid some aggression issues like that. But right now with the powder, my powder blue, completely peaceful, no issues with him, but he's also the second smallest tang in the tank so do you guys uh, ever notice like a, a hierarchy uh between the tanks? Oh, absolutely yeah. i do but for the most part they uh they all get along and they all school together which is awesome once in a while i'll see it but not not really my my blue tang is absolutely the king of that tank and i've and everybody got along really well, but now that the Flamingi is getting bigger, he's getting close to the size of the blue tang. I've noticed a little bit of tail slapping going on. I'm thinking they're battling for dominance at this point. The Flamingi will absolutely be the king of that tank eventually. It's just going to get so much bigger than that blue tang. And it's all about to go to hell here in a second anyways, because once that sail fin goes in, that sail fin is so much bigger than anything else in there. That is going to be, that'll be interesting. Because normally... Normally, I like like similar size stuff in there, but this sailfin is so much bigger. Um, if he de- decides he's going to be a problem, he could be a real problem. So we'll see how that works out. You know, Scott, when your flamingi gets full size, you might have to donate them to your local aquarium. <laughs> well, that's just it. I mean, I've got what I feel like is a big tank, and it's a 210-gallon tank, but that flamingi could easily outgrow my tank. So that's actually something I may have to deal with in the future. Right now, it's not going to be a problem, but in 5, 10 years, I really could be looking at something too big for a 210. Yeah. yeah. I always said, you know, and I would – I would really hate to part with, say, the Fowlery, and I almost did once when I had the 75-gallon. I didn't want to do it, and I've got a video on it. I, I took them to, back to the store that I bought them, and they were actually going to give me a store credit, probably because they're one of the cooler LRSs, um, but also he's such a gorgeous fish. And I wound up leaving the store with him in the bucket. He just he was chilling out, and I looked at him, and I said, here he is. He was just sitting there, and uh, I just couldn't bring myself to do it, which is one of the biggest reasons I did break the bank a little bit, and I upgraded to the 125-gallon was for that guy. 
Um, because a 75, four feet long was just a little too small for him. He was growing. But that's what I would probably do is donate him to one of my favorite museums, the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago, and let him just have full run of the large tank in the center display. Who knows how many thousands of gallons it is, but it greets you when you walk in. Um, that was a great a great aquarium. I went there uh, three weeks ago when I was in, in oh, Chicago. Oh, good. I'm That's glad. Did you see the, the reef area with the sharks yes. down below? Oh, That's yeah. kind of a hidden area. Awesome. Yeah. yeah, that, yeah. You know what? Um, when I started uh, thinking about getting into the hobby, it was just kind of like a thought that I toyed with. And it would just kind of haunt me every few months. And then it would go away. And then the last visit to the Shedd Aquarium... I saw that whole reef display with the sharks and massive clown tank display they had. That just, that's it. I'm getting one. I, yeah. I don't know what I'm doing, but I'm getting one. <laughs> and I, I went to the my first LRS um, the next day, Sunday. But yeah, that, that, that aquarium is what did it to me. It finally it brought me in. I'm like, that's it. <laughs> Got to get into the hobby. Uh, so also say that I don't know if you guys uh, notice um, since you've gotten more more tangs do you find yourself doing a larger water change or a uh, more frequent water changes and how has your nutrient load um, changed uh, as yes. far as your, your bio load as far as affecting your nit nitrates now with myself I don't have as many tangs as you guys do yeah. but in my in my larger tank um, my nutrient load hasn't been affected because I'm using the uh, CCAM nitrate test kit um, because in my opinion, the API is just an entry level and it's still good. I'm going to use it until it expires, but uh, there's a difference when you're testing for nitrates on an API versus a CCAM. And uh, my levels using the, uh, the pond matrix and my bio pellet reactor, they're really, it's cut my nitrates hmm. in half. Yeah. Um, you know, that's a great, great point i just wanted to add to that you you were mentioning the pond matrix to me and i was this close to putting it in my cart when i was on amazon i still probably might but i'm just yes i so yeah with with my huge bio load with all those tangs i think i'm gonna go to a 15 gallon water change a week because my nitrates are hovering around 40 i can't get them down that's why you know scott was telling me to just try the bio pellet reactor so i built my own and I'm I'm really looking forward to this kicking in. Uh, what is it, Scott? Like a month before you might it, start to it, see. It takes like a month, yeah. Right. So the pond matrix. You know why I didn't get it? I'm wondering if it's if there's much difference between that and the marine pure block. That's why I didn't get the pond matrix because so, I thought I've already got a marine pure block, which isn't doing much for me at all. You know. So I would be I would be surprised if either the pond matrix or the marine pure block. Bleh. Marine pure block can do much to eliminate nitrates um, because at that point you need the denitrifying bacteria, which is in anaerobic conditions and all that. Um, where I think the gains come in are with the bio pellets, where the bio pellets have yeah. actually been shown to remove the nitrates. And that's how I get away with it, right? I mean, to some extent, I have huge rocks up in my main display, right? I got one, I got one rock that's 30 pounds i'll bet you that thing's doing a good job removing nitrates itself oh, yeah. because of how big and dense it is but really the heart of my filtration is a huge bio pellet reactor and a huge skimmer yeah that's yeah, gonna I, be key i kind of agree with that i'm i'm running the uh i don't know if you know steve but if scott told you i've got the uh i've got a video i put out on my uh, uh stuff that i've got i purchased uh, a while ago um and I got the uh, BRS, the uh, BR140, for my um, my 300 bio pellet reactor, and I was running a lifeguard pump. I might have, but there it didn't work out, so I, I just invested and I got two Eheim pumps, one for each tank, and uh, it makes those bio pellets really tumble really well. And that's the key: you don't want those bio pellets to clump in there. Um, you want them to tumble. It's gonna it's gonna affect the uh, bacteria differently when it's tumbling like that. Um, but me personally, using the uh, bio pellet reactor in conjunction with the uh, 
the uh, Seachem uh, Pond Matrix. I'm running uh, four liters in there in a open porous bag, um, like a cantaloupe bag. And my nitrates went way down, way down. And uh, yeah. I have to thank Cyber Aquarius for that. Uh, he, you know, that's I researched that, and uh, I agree with him. That's really macro porous, and even more so than uh, Marine Pure Black, even really? though that's a product. Yeah. All right. So I was thinking about taking the Marine Pure Black out of my sump. Maybe I'll do that and get some of those, and I'll put well, them nothing, in my overflow. There's nothing, there's nothing wrong with the Marine Pure Block. It's just from what I've read, it's not as macro porous as the uh, Pond Matrix. But if you've already got the Marine Pure Block in there, let your yeah. I would let your bio pellet reactor kick in for a while like yeah. Scott was saying and uh, see how your levels go down well I gotta and get a stronger pump for that reactor because they're tumbling but they're 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 tumbling that's all I can say they're just tumbling they're barely <laughs> right yeah. I gotta get a stronger pump yeah I can tell you my bio pellet reactor I'm running like a full I just added a full liter bag yesterday to it of bio pellets there's probably half a liter maybe in there so I've got like a liter and a half and I'm running that right off my return pump which is a big old um, reflow hammerhead pump so hmm. I've got loads of power behind that thing I, I've got it turned down quite a bit and it still tumbles great but um, yeah, I, I recommend a huge pump for bio pellets. I know we're kind of getting off subject on the tangs a little bit, but it's really important to remember your water chemistry with tangs because they are just such dirty fish. Right. I mean, a tank full of chromies isn't going to put out too much waste. Right. A tank full of tangs is a lot of waste. Yeah, especially for my size tank. So I have to do more cleaning and housekeeping than you guys. Absolutely, um, yeah. And I, I, I'm doing everything I can. And I can do. the nitrates are still pegged at like 40. I cannot get beneath that unless I do sugar dosing. So as I talked about on the live live show last night, you got to get to the source of the problem, the sugar dosing or even the bio pellet reactor. Um, I don't want to say they band-aid the problem, but if we didn't have high nitrates, we wouldn't need bio pellet reactors, well, right? I'm not here, saying they're bad. I'm just saying that... If I didn't have a high bio load, if I had the one Fowlery tank right. and a pair of clowns and a Gobi, I wouldn't have this issue, you know. But I mean, but I don't, I don't look at it as banding the problem. I look at it as supercharging your tank, right? No, I agree. If, yeah. if you're, if you, I know, I don't know if you guys remember ten years ago in the hobby before all the <clears throat> carbon dosing and all that stuff was big, you'd have a tank with like two clown, a reef tank was like two clownfish and a yellow tang. Yeah, right. Beyond that, I mean, your nitrates would go out of control. Your coral would start to die. People would do massive water changes trying to keep everything under control. Where now with the carbon dosing, i am got a big stock list compared to what we used to do. And my nitrates are undetectable. I think uh, um, if you're running a fish-only tank, uh, 30 to 40 ppm uh it's not really gonna harm the fish no. you know but as far as going into corals yes and that's yeah. something i'm venturing into but uh i don't think steve you know if you're running 40 parts per million on your tank uh it's um kind of a level where you're kind of a borderline i would say but uh, I, I never had any problems you know when i had my 300 at about 40 parts per million but uh i certainly like it now it's lower <laughs> so but um these are all great points um i was looking up something on the phone on um uh, i can't find it but i just think that for tangs uh having a you know nutrient load lower is is kind of paramount because um right. i think in watching this video right. as a, a bunch of different tanks will probably agree that uh, having a good filtration um, and uh, keeping a nutrient low, low down is pretty important as well as a good diet. But uh, I just wanted to ask you guys your experiences since you've got multiple right. tanks in your tanks. Well, it, it's counterintuitive, right? Because we're telling people to avoid aggression, heavily feed your fish, <laughs> and then we're telling them to keep their nitrates low. Right. It, it's the exact opposite of how it should work. Right. So it, it it's kind of one of those you're damned if you do or you're damned if you don't. That's why I swear by the carbon dosing is I think that's what's made my system successful. I just don't have nitrate issues. 
Yeah, you're lucky. But I mean, then again, maybe, you've got a sweet Maybe in tank. five years I will, but you for have now. tons of rock that look awesome. Awesome aquascape. Um, large yeah, tank, my, 210 gallons. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. In my 300, I'm running uh, over 200 pounds of rock in there. Yep. Um, and about the same amount in my in my reef tank that I'm I'm going is constantly going right now that I'm going to be getting coral in here in a couple of weeks. But uh, I think that's a benefit for you, Scott, is having you know probably in excess of 200 pounds of live rock in. Oh yeah. You know you've got nitrifying bacteria that's going to be right on those rocks mm -hmm. there. So, so right, it's really great. So I've got loads of nitrifying bacteria, and I'd be willing to bet because some of those rocks are so big that I'm actually getting denitrifying bacteria deep right. inside. I can't guarantee it, but that's how it's supposed to work. And that's why I went with the Marine Pure because it, not the Marine Pure biospheres, but the block. The big block, it's thicker, yeah. Thicker, and that's where the anaerobic bacteria will live because there's less oxygen levels. Um, it 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 doesn't matter if it's in your sump or in your tank. I thought about moving it to my tank. See, because as you guys know, I don't have much rock work. I just have a decent amount of rock work as a showpiece to make my tank look artsy. Because I have so many tangs, as Scott said, I, I got these tanks with keeping in mind I'm going to have tangs. Um, much less rock work, because if I had really nice rock work like Scott, my tangs wouldn't have anywhere to swim. So my right. tank is mostly empty. They're not stacked higher than maybe, you know, seven inches tall. So they can swim way above and around and everything. So that's why I need a marine pure block to keep well, everything in kind of in check. Or the uh, pond matrix, which I'll look into as well. I'll add that too. Your rock also serves another purpose, right? Your fish do a lot better if they have a place to hide. They're right, a lot less right. stressed if they have the rock that they can swim into. So you don't want to go rockless on your tank. You need to provide at least enough um, holes and caves for them to get in and hide. And especially blue tangs, they like a, a crevice that they can actually jam themselves into and sleep at night. So that's just that's just a nice thing to think about when you're doing your aquascape for your tanks is provide lots of caves and stuff for these fish to be in. It's counterintuitive, but the more places you give your fish to hide, the more they'll come out. Right. I, I agree with that. I, I feel that they have a kind of a safe haven to go into. It, uh, <clears throat> it makes them feel better. Um, I'll look into my tank at night and uh, get some ambient light in the background, but the only tang I see out swimming as my orange shoulder back all the other tangs the other three tangs you don't see them until the next day yeah. they, they wedge themselves in between rocks and uh, what I did on mine is I created a, you know, a escaping into two different formations so I've got room off the back of the wall and the rock work so the fish can essentially kind of do laps back yep, there that's right so um, that's what my but, guys uh, do too my rock is yeah. just kind of in the center yeah and they can go around and above and through right. yep Right, Plus, right. it helps with the water flow too. You don't want to get anything trapped right. in there. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <clears throat> so, uh, like I, <clears throat> I agree with Scott. It does provide a safe haven for them, for them to uh, swim into and uh, um, feel less stressed. I suspect psychologically, what you guys are doing with the rock uh, probably makes the tank feel bigger <clears throat> to the fish, anyways, because there's two long sections that they can kind of swim around. Right. Right, that's exactly right. If I didn't have tangs, I'd have more rock like you, Scott, because that looks awesome. It makes it look more like a reef in a way, you know, because you've got well, the other, hiding the other places and it just looks cool. Well, the other difference is is my tank is meant to be seen just from the front, mm -hmm. where your tank you want to see from both sides, which makes stacking the rock a lot harder, especially with a narrower tank. Right, that's, that's right. And when I had to remove all that rock to get that um, uh, starry blenny out it was a it was a pain I had to remove all the rock and then it took maybe an hour hour and a half to try and find a way to stack it back because it's like a, a puzzle what goes with what yeah. and now what looks cool no that looks like I just have a pile of rocks let me restack it now it looks awesome so that's it's more difficult in that sense but my plus I, I was going for more artistic approach and 
more importantly, swimming space for these tangs, you know. And you know what? I have to go now because I have uh, stuff going. I got to see a guy about a thing over at the place. <laughs> <laughs> But um, so I'm gonna sign out. You guys feel free to keep going. Of course, you know. Well, I I think this is a good place to cut yeah. it. What I think we're gonna do, I, if you're okay with this, Steve, I think we just do one long episode this Sunday. We'll skip next weekend. So sorry, guys, no episode next weekend. Well, I've got I've got older just... shows that we haven't uploaded. I've got like a few, like three. So I'll just oh. I'll do that and I'll, I'll send it to you then. Okay, let's do that then. Okay, so yes, but you know what? I'm gonna. Tell you guys, uh, Darren, thank you so much for being on. Always yes. awesome. You're and, welcome. Uh, you guys, if you want to be on Reef Talk, send us an instant message on our channels, Rod or Tube Reef, Mile High Reefers, or email us at reeftalkshow at gmail.com. Um, we'll put it up here in the des 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 description below. I need more sleep. But thank you so much. If you have any comments or questions, subscribe to our channels, comment, ask questions below, help each other out, and uh, you know, good luck with, with your tangs. They're gorgeous fish. We highly recommend them. Just have to put a little more care into those guys because they are, as all saltwater creatures, fragile, but these guys, a little more so. Yeah, I just wanted to say thanks for having me on the show. It's been nice. And check yeah, out I Darren's say, channel as well. A link exactly. to Darren's channel will be... Uh, in the description below that's what i wanted to say it seems like every few weeks darren puts a video out and my jaw drops at what he just bought so I know. 